Tonight we are going to cover introduction and unit one, okay, or the first week in your workbook. Remember I'm teaching from the workbook, okay, and I know many classes are only using the book, and so <clears throat> teachers, you will have to make the adjustment on how you want to change my teaching plan. Now, teachers, I will give you the teaching plan at the end of class, okay? So I'm not giving you, give it to you at the front of class so you'll be reading it instead of participating. Or leave. Or leave, exactly, <laughs> Joe, exactly. All right, so let's get started. We'll have prayer after you do one exercise. If you look in your packet that's sitting in front of you, I'd like for you to do the top sheet. Read the scripture, answer the questions, please. <clears throat> All right, will you join me in prayer? Father, I give you thanks tonight that we have the opportunity freely to join together and study your word. Thank you for this book, Father, that Dr. Blackaby has written that explains how we can understand how you work, Father, and how we can come alongside where you are working to be loved by you, to be guided by you, to be blessed by you, and to develop a relationship with you. Father, guide our discussion tonight. <clears throat> guide our classes, our classmates, as we learn together how to experience you in the fullness of your love. And we give you thanks now in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, what about this first page surprised you? <clears throat> or did it surprise you? Worksheet one. Okay, this is a discussion class. Thank you, Wayne. I'm always amazed by the fact that it says Jesus does nothing except by the Father. And why does that surprise you? Anyone else? Models for human folks, or at least a model that we can understand. Okay. And how do you understand this, Gene? That the Father has taught from the mouth of his son to us that we need to ask the question. Okay. How, how did Jesus get taught? I'm trying to get to the base of, of your statement. Okay, he saw what his father was doing. Is that the only thing? Yeah, yeah. Um, we know that, and you know, and I know, that by reading scripture, we see that Jesus spent a lot of time with the father. And he made time for that prayer time. And that was critical time for him, so he would know what he was to do that day or any day, and we're going to get there. All right, if you'll look at worksheet two, the next page. <coughs> Yes, you may. Joanne, I think, like for me, I kind of lose sight of the fact that God is working mm -hmm. around me. Mm -hmm. Like, because mm -hmm. you get so busy with life that you just sort of lose the perspective that God is working and then taking the time to see it. Or being Absolutely. In touch with it. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Number two, and what do you see in number two here, friends? <clears throat> Okay, Ed sees stick figures, all right. Does anybody else see anything a little deeper than stick figures? All right, this is what I want you to do on this page. Underneath the diagram of the seven realities, I want you to look at each of the seven statements, and I want you to circle what you think is the most critical information in that statement. So, for instance, the first statement that answers number one says, God is always at work around you. What's the critical part of that statement? And do that with each of the realities. <clears throat> All right, everybody finished? All right, you will see the picture also around the room. And then seven of you have the seven realities. So whoever's got reality number one, 
would you read that reality to us? And if you want to comment on that, that is encouraged. So who has reality number one? Mike. Right. All right. Any comment on that? And to see what he's doing. Yeah. Right. If we haven't had our prayer time that morning, if we haven't connected with the Father, are we going to see his hand working in our lives that day? Yeah. All right. Number two. Reality number two. Who's got that? Yes, sir. Oh, no, not unit two, Gene. It's reality, too. There's, it should say on the top of the page. Thanks, Susan. God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. Okay, what does that mean, Susan? The word pursue really mm. stands out because that's a pretty strong word. It is a strong word. Have you ever thought God was pursuing you any day of your life? Yeah. That's a very strong thing. <clears throat> that everybody in the world needs to hear that. Yeah. All right. Reality number three. God invites you to become involved with him in prayer. Okay. What does that mean, Dad? I think a lot of times it's a mystery because we think God can do whatever he wants and doesn't really need us. Mm. Uh, it's saying that we need to be a part of his work to complete his plan. Mm. And he wants us to be a part of his work. That's the awesome thing. All right, reality number four. God is pleased by the Holy Spirit, <coughs> Bible, prayer, Christmas dancing, and the church to reveal himself, his truth, and his glory. Yeah. And I would just add to that, you know, reading the Bible, prayer, church, <coughs> things that require us to involve him if we want to have a relationship with him. Good. All right, reality number five. Someone has a card sitting in front of them that says reality five, number five. On the top it says seven realities, and underneath it it says five. You've got it, Betty? Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> Yeah, that isn't the right one. That's well, but that's in the, that's something else. Somebody else has it. Says seven realities. Yeah, five. All right. So crisis of belief. What does that say in the statement? And what does crisis of belief mean? Have you ever had a crisis of belief? What caused the crisis of belief? Mm. So it made you decide you had to either rely on God to get the job done or run from God. Is that what it's saying? <clears throat> oh, yes. Yeah. Or am I just going to stop and do anything? But mm -hmm. this was just a big 
light bulb? Yes, mm -hmm. big light bulb. And I had never considered that, <clears throat> you know, when he's inviting us to work with him, that we have that choice. That we really have the choice. Yeah. Every day. Okay, good. Hmm. Why do you want it to be easy, Vicki? I just want it to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like it should be hard once, but then it seems like it should be easier. And then it says always when you first start. Mm -hmm. It's like it's temporary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, but as we grow in Christ, <clears throat> everything gets a little harder. <clears throat> a little child. It does. I don't, I don't believe that it always leads to hardship. Okay. How come, Ken? Well, I mean, it doesn't always lead to hardship or disease. It leads to different from a process of going about doing something. Read the whole sentence again. Yeah. It leads to a process of relief. No, read the whole sentence. It requires a process. Okay. But the process of relief, that phrase is. Okay. Will you hold that thought and let us finish this lesson and then you and I talk about that? Because some of the greatest people in Christian history, even though they came out of it fine, it was a crisis of belief. So we're going to talk about one of those, so hold on to that thought. Yes, Vicki? <clears throat> All right, hold on to the thought so we can give you an example and then tell me if you don't understand. Okay? Hold it, Ken. I promise we won't forget you. Okay, adjust, number six. Who's got seven realities, number six? The top of the card says seven realities, and the number circled says six. Okay, all right, and we have to make an adjustment. <clears throat> I don't know how this is going. That's right, I'm in a crisis of belief. Did I put those on the table? Um, sure. Yes. We must make major jumps and realize the very God we must trust. All right, read it again a little louder. So, why would Dr. Blackaby think that to join God in what he is doing is going to take adjustments in our life? This isn't a trick question. Because we're not doing what God is doing on our own. So when we find out what God is doing, we have to change what we're doing if we're going to join him. Yeah. Number one, we're not God. And number two, if it's a God-sized task, which everything is, if it's his task, it's a God-sized task. And it's going to take us making an adjustment to be able to do that task. And we're going to give an example here in just a minute. And finally, we get to obey and experience him because we've, we've had the crisis, we've made the adjustment. All right, now, what I want you to do is <clears throat> turn to the next page and you have a blank piece of paper. Number seven is obey and experience. I just said that. Oh, you had it? I gave up on the piece of paper. I made an adjustment. And I said, forget it. Yeah. Crisis of belief. Crisis of belief. All right. <clears throat> now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the life of Moses. And there are three of you, Girl Scout Honor, that have pieces of paper. One says Exodus 3, 1 through 12. Raise your hand if you have that yellow sheet of paper. Doug found one. It's a yellow piece of paper. No, no, not that one. All right, which one do you have? Exodus 4. Brian, you've got Exodus 3, 1 through 12? Okay, that's not one. What? Okay, Jim Adams, who has got Exodus 3, 18 to 22? Good. And so who's got Exodus 4? 
Okay. All right, this is what we're going to do <clears throat> now that we found the three pieces of paper. All right, we're going to read those three passages, and as you're hearing the Moses story, I want you to write down where God was at work, the relationship happened, the invitation to work happened, God speaking, crisis of belief. Basically, you're going to test what Blackaby says happens when God speaks to us. God invites us to join him. Okay, ready? Here we go. The person who has Exodus 3, 1 through 12, please read. All right. You should have gotten some of these stages in what Jim just read. I hope you're writing it down. All right, who's got 18 through 22? Please please read. <clears throat> All right, next one, 4, 29 through 5, 1. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the all right. for the people. Where did you hear God working in those passages? What did he say to me? To rescue, he's come down to rescue um, the Israelites from the power of the Egyptians. All right. So he heard their cries, mm -hmm. and he's come to rescue them. All right. That's number one. What? How was he pursuing a relationship in number two? Where did you hear God pursuing a relationship? Okay. Did he talk to Moses? Mm -hmm. Did he show himself in a burning bush? Mm -hmm. He did. So he was pursuing a relationship. Did we hear an invitation from God in this passage? What was the invitation? I will what? Work with you. All right. Any other invitation? Right. Yeah. He said, you need to go and bring the Egyptians, I mean the Israelites, out of Egypt. All right. <clears throat> so did God speak any more after he gave the invitation? Did he give any more details of what he was going to do? Exactly. Right. Now, what was the crisis of belief for Moses, whether you heard it in these passages or not? You know this passage. What was his crisis of belief? Exactly. And what were his reasons other than who am I? I can't speak well. Anything else? They won't believe you. All right. Exactly. So there was a complicated crisis of belief. And so what caused him to adjust? Yeah. But did he answer his questions? Did God take the time to answer Moses' questions? Yeah. So he gave somebody to be his spokesperson. He said, I will be with you. He, and when he answered the question, he says, tell them I am is with you. All right. And so what, how did Moses obey and experience God in this whole thing? How did it happen after it all got figured out? Did he go to Egypt? And he spoke to Pharaoh? And did Pharaoh listen to him the first time? No. And we know the rest of the story. And so for ten times he didn't, and finally he said, get out of my sight when his son died. Now, that was the major first step in crisis of belief or experiencing God for Moses. You and I know the story that he continued to experience God, didn't he? He went through this crisis many times with God. But how do we remember Moses? Do we remember him as a weakling? We don't. We remember him as a man of faith. <clears throat> and that's what we want to be. All right, let's keep going. 
Now, as we do the overview, we're in the overview part, I want you to see um, how the units of the book, the workbook rather, um, are organized. This is a list of all of the units that we will be studying and you can see the titles. Unit one and two, you are gonna see a broad view of the way God works in the lives of people now. Folks in the back, you have the exact same board as up here because I know it's hard for y'all to see way back there. Units three through nine are where we're going to explain in greater detail the seven realities of experiencing God. 10 and 11, we're going to focus on the church and the larger body of the kingdom of God. And then finally, unit 12 will sum up by helping members apply these truths to their lives. Now, the amazing thing in all of this it's just not number 12. We're going to be applying this all the way through. And if you all remember in this book, for all, because so many of you have said, Joanne, I've done this, and I hear that. <clears throat> but this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be studying the workbook, which means five days a week we're going to do a devotional. And we're going to do the work in the book of how it applies to me and what I'm learning. Okay? We're going to memorize a Bible verse. I know you haven't done that in a very long time, but it's good for us. And I'm going to say the Bible verse for you, and I'm going to close my eyes. No, I'm not. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> Let's see if I can get this right. John 15, 5. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Any man that is in me and I am in him will bear much fruit. Without me, you will bear nothing. That's what... The first week is all about bearing fruit because we are in God the Father. Okay, <clears throat> we um, are not going to do the unit explanation at this point so we can finish tonight. I think they're pretty self-explanatory and we'll spend plenty of time with them. This is what I want to say to you about the study as we introduce this. You know, when you're in college, the 101 classes are normally your freshman classes, right? Your number two, 201, and uh, you know, that's sophomore. And I want to tell you that I think experiencing God is at least a 400 level, if not PhD work. And the reason is, <clears throat> it is going to cause us to question and I, I'm glad it's going to cause us to question how we have lived, how we have assumed that we understand everything about God and what he is doing. Because I want us to be awakened again about what God is doing. Don't you want to be surprised again by God? Don't you want to be awed again by God? Just in this first week, as I've done the daily devotions, I'm excited in the morning when I get up, you know, and get to read these powerful words that Dr. Blackaby and Claude have written because they're, they're making me think deeper. And I want you to know that's what this is about. And it's your and my responsibility as leaders and classmates to challenge one another. And it's okay to ask questions but challenge one another in your classes. Ask the deeper questions and make sure everybody's doing their devotional study, whether you're using the book or you're using the workbook. It will warm your heart, it will help you to see God with new eyes, and it will help you to go deeper in Christ. All right? So the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to learn how to hear when God is speaking. We're going to recognize where he is working. We're going to join him in his work. And we're going to experience him working through us to accomplish his purpose. All right. <clears throat> now we're going to start on unit one. I need somebody to open up their workbook to page 16. And I need you to read... Jesus' example on that page. Uh, and if actually you've got the set, if you don't have a workbook, you've got it in your packet. And it's the very top shaded box. If somebody will read those seven things for us, please. Go 
Go ahead. Jesus, is, Jesus is an example. The Father has been working right up until now. Now the Father has me working. I do nothing on my own initiative. I watch to see what the Father is doing. I do what I see the Father doing. The Father loves me. He shows me everything he is doing. All right. Now, there are seven of you that have scripture verses on a bright yellow piece of paper. Will everybody look for the bright yellow piece of paper that has a scripture verse? Thank you. Will you hold them up so I can see all seven? I see three. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, look on your table for a little skinny piece of... Thank you, Brian. All right, we'll take the ones we've got. Can you take them to the bottom of the chair or something? No, I, I had them sitting. Oh, yes, there's another one. There's another one. All right. Mary, would you read the first one for us? John seven sixteen. So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. All right, thank you. Mike? Go ahead. Good. Is there one more? Vicki? Mm -hmm. John 8, 28 to 29. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I am living in my own Father. <coughs> Good. Jerry? All right. This reminds us of the very first worksheet we did. What is Jesus testifying to the people around him about what his ministry is? What is Jesus' ministry? It's the ministry of God. Mm -hmm. All right. When did he decide that ministry? Do you think when he was in the desert that he was having to decide whose ministry he was going to do? Because I think he was tempted. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point that he had to decide, was I going to do the flash in the pan? Mm -hmm. Was I going to heal for the wrong reason? Feed for the wrong reason? And it was then that Jesus decided, I want to do what the Father sent me to do. And that's what these verses are telling us today. Now, I want us to talk about Jesus deciding to do that as we look at a passage in John 4, 1 through 42. Now, we're not going to read this passage, <clears throat> but we're going to talk about the choice that Jesus had here. And that's what Unit 1 is about, us making choices. This passage is about Jesus going through Samaria. And there's a map over here, and I know everybody can't see it, but best we can do. So Jesus and the disciples have been down in Judea in this area and have decided to go to Galilee. Now, Judea is this, the lower orange um, area of the map. And we all know the shortest distance between two points is what? A straight line. So here's Jerusalem, and here's Galilee where they're going. So to go from Jerusalem to Galilee, you go through a country that Jews don't like to go through, which is Samaria. Why don't Jews like Samaritans? Ed, why don't Jews like Samaritans? 
Well, it's it's tit for tat. I mean, the Jews were pretty ugly to the Samaritans. The Samaritans were pretty ugly to the to the Jews, and it had a history going back three hundred years. Uh, and the Jews under uh, the Maccabees destroyed the Samaritan temple and forcibly tried to com convert the Samaritans. So it, it's not a pretty situation. All right. Aren't the Samaritans like a deluded? I mean, weren't they Jews Half-breeds. Mm -hmm. so, <coughs> yeah, the, 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 uh, when the Northern <coughs> Kingdom was destroyed by Assyria, Assyria had the way of managing people, of taking people out of their indigenous land and moving them to a newly conquered land. So people that were conquered 500 miles away were moved to Samaria, and they were moved to where the conquered people had came from. They didn't move everybody because some of them hid in caves and ravines, and so there was a lot of intermarriage. And when Jeremiah, uh, or when... Uh, Who were the two prophets that came back from the Babylonian Ezra captivity? And uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah, when they came back from Babylon, uh, they had already developed a purist idea of what constituted a Jew. And when the Samaritans offered to help in building the temple, they rebuffed them and said, this has nothing to do with you. You're, and pretty much said, you're a half-breed people. We don't want your help. And so they were off and running in a bad situation right there. Thank you. I knew he could do that extemporaneously. <laughs> okay, so Jesus has had a crisis of belief, right? And he had the crisis of belief when he was in the desert. He had to decide how he was going to live and for whom he was going to live. And he's chosen to live for God. So Jesus is a Jew. The disciples need to go to Galilee. The fastest way is through Samaria. Jews didn't go through Samaria. Jews actually went up, out, and around, which is a lot of extra walking. The scripture says in this passage that they chose to go into Samaria. They stopped at Sychar. And a Samaritan woman comes to Jacob's well where Jesus is sitting and resting. And what does Jesus say to this woman that has come at the sixth hour when women don't ever come? Give me some water. She had a jar. And what does she say to him? Why are you asking me for water? And Jesus knows it's his opportunity to do the Father's will. He said, if you knew the living water that I could give you, you would ask me for the living water. And, he, and, sh and then she says, you know the story. You know, Jesus says, go get your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. He says, yes, because you have five. And the story goes on, and she calls him a prophet and ends up bringing people back to see him. The disciples don't like it. They haven't had the same crisis of belief. But Jesus had a choice that day in what he wanted to do and how he wanted to lead the disciples. He could have gone this side route. He didn't have to go through Samaria. They could have walked the long way. But Jesus, because he had had the crisis of belief in the desert, believed that doing the Father's will was going through Samaria and taking the opportunity to love and share with somebody in Samaria, and it was this woman. Do you agree or disagree with what I've just said? Yes, Janice. Okay, she gave me a thumbs up in the back row. Any comments on that example? It's interesting, then. You said he didn't have to go through Samaria, mm -hmm. but John said that he did have to go to Samaria. Mm -hmm. in, in verse 4 it says he had to travel through Samaria, mm -hmm. and but he didn't have to, but he did have to. Mm -hmm. But at the end, you know, when they, the disciples come back with their food, he says, I don't, I don't need any food. And he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Mm -hmm. and so, so God what, was working in Samaria. And mm -hmm. then Jesus was finishing. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, my notes with that four four, it's kind of hard to go 
Mm -hmm. It says the necessity lay in Jesus' mission, mm -hmm. not in the geography. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, God's will in your life. That's what this is all about. What I want you to do now is I want you to get in a group of four. It can be your table group, like this group is pretty easy. It can be, you can turn around and do two behind you if that's easier. That would be a perfect foursome right here, foursome right there. In your sheets, your handouts, there are some questions for you to work on together about what we've been talking about. And your sheet should say, your next sheet should say quad activity directions. I want you to spend the next 10 minutes working on these questions first and then having prayer time together. So if you would get with four people in a group and work on all of these questions and then have prayer together. Um, our time is up. Teachers in this room, there are outlines for you with all the handouts that you need right here. If you want to come get a set, you're welcome to mold it for your class. If you do not have a workbook and need one, there's a stack of them here and you're welcome to come get one. Thank you. It's been wonderful having you tonight. God bless you on your first week.